I think I'm going to call this Ten Commandments for Dummies. Stay tuned. We're in a series on Mark, and last week we talked about uh, Mark 1, 40 through 45, and a man with a skin disease came begging Jesus, kneeling before him, if you're willing, you'll make me clean, or you can make me clean. And Jesus replied, I am willing, I will make you clean. And we talked about that. Jesus was moved with compassion, stretched out his hand, he touched him, he said, I'm willing, be made clean. Um, the skin disease left him, and he was made clean. Then Jesus sternly warned him and sent him away, saying, uh, don't say anything to anyone. Just go to the uh, priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded you in a testimony to them. But the guy disregarded those orders. He went out and began to proclaim it freely and spread the word so that uh, no one could, or Jesus himself, rather, could not go into the town, but openly stayed out in the country, and people came to him from every quarter. So you could, I guess, ding the guy for not following Jesus's orders, or you could uh, focus on the fact that he couldn't keep his mouth shut. Uh, did Jesus know this? Oh, probably, but he, he was trying to stay in town. Uh, did it have consequences? Of course, Jesus' uh, reputation spread even more, and he had to go outside of town. There would be room there, and really the people who came to him were pre-qualifying themselves to hear the message. They were saying, I'm here. I'm going to the extra trouble to come. But Jesus refers back to Moses. And that's where we're going to be today because uh, we actually have a crossover in our lectionary between what we say when we repeat the words of Jesus, what Moses told you to do, and what the guy may or may not have done. I Presumably he did it, but he didn't do it before he started talking. And I guess we could spend a lot of time on that, but I want to focus on that idea of uh, living by what Moses said. And before we do that, let's pray together. Our Father, our Father which art in heaven, holy, hallowed, sanctified be your name. May your kingdom come your kingdom of righteousness and truth and love and justice and mercy. May that kingdom come, the rule of Christ in our lives, and may your will be done. All that is perfect and true and right about your will, that same will that was willing to cleanse the leper. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, where your word is just spoken and done. Give us today, this day, this Sunday and every day and any day that people are engaging in this message, daily bread, which covers all of our basic needs and what we need to serve you and to live your healing, your grace, your feeding, your provision. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses because we have trespassed. We have stepped over the line, the line that violates the dignity of others and the line that violates your holiness. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us because we would not clog the line with our pride and with our self-righteousness and with our sense that we are not in need of forgiveness and that we need to extend that same forgiveness to others. Forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we know that at every corner we are vulnerable and we are likely to fall. And that only by your leadership and your strength will we avoid the pitfalls. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. Now, Jesus says to the guy, do what Moses commanded you. Go fulfill the law. Now, this was a priestly function that he needed to have done, and it arises out of the instructions for the uh, holiness code that is especially articulated in the book of Leviticus. The first five books of the Hebrew scriptures are the Torah, the law. We shorten it to the law, the Torah. The first is Genesis. And in Genesis, you have the buildup of the covenant, all the basis for the covenant, the history of God choosing a people by choosing many people along the way and a lineage through which to reveal through Moses a covenant for a nation that will be a nation of priests to deliver a message of God's truth to the world. And that takes you from Genesis into Levit to Exodus, and Exodus uh, mingles the story with uh, more exposition on the Ten Commandments, which is at the core of it all. And then in Deuteronomy, as the journey from uh, the desert progresses uh, and is about to conclude, and Moses is about to die, and he is giving the final admonition, uh, he, he wraps it up, exposition, sermon, and Deuteronomy is uh, that final sermon that Moses delivered, the book of Leviticus is the holiness code. It uh, tells us what we need to do uh, or what the children of Israel need to do to uh, worship in the holy place, worship in the tabernacle, worship uh, later in the temple, and uh, maintain uh, a uniqueness among all the nations. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. What does it mean to enter the promised land as the people of God? This is the Torah, the five books, the Pentateuch, the law, or as would be commonly said, Moses, because uh, so much of it gathers around the life and the ministry of Moses. So the Old Testament reading for today in the lectionary uh, series is Exodus 20, 1 through 17, and you will recognize it as the Ten Commandments. And it is so familiar that people will shrug and say, uh, done now, uh, I know that. Doesn't everybody know that? But it begins with, the first verse, it says, then God spoke all these words. And then God identifies himself by using the uh, letters that we would write as uh, Y-H-W-H. -H. I am the Lord. I am Adonai. I am Hashem. Uh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
Now, this beginning of the Ten Commandments leans into a notion that's really a false notion that there are options that every nation, every people, every tribe can have its own personal God, and that there are many gods, and that the people of Yahweh can pick and choose and have many gods, because uh, as families merged, uh, we even see it in the, in the patriarchs. Uh, maybe the, the bride will bring all of her family gods uh, into the relationship and will adopt uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as may maybe the top dog God or maybe just another God. But God is saying to the people, just one for you. Well, it will take them more than just this moment to learn that lesson. They will struggle with this for generations. But God is predicting something that is universal. The very name of God, the God who is, the God of existence, is a universal God. And whereas the gods of tribes and the gods of the forces of nature uh, may have uh, unique and very limited abilities, like in the Greek pantheon or the Roman pantheon, uh, gods with specific purposes, or any form of a polytheism, God is saying, uh, I'm unique, I have it all. It's all wrapped up in me. You may have all of these uh, representations of qualities of God, but those are just, and sometimes they're pretty mean and, 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 and not very godlike. But I'm the God who's got it all. I'm the complete package. So there's no need and there's no appropriateness in having any God before me. The complete package. God is the complete God. Therefore, verse 4 says, you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or anything that is earth, in earth beneath or water beneath or water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I am the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation, those who love me and keep my commandments. Well, this is a pretty tough statement, isn't it? The consequences out of the covenant of not observing the covenant. And God is doing an anthropomorphic a representation of himself saying he's jealous, uh, not in the way that we are petty in our jealousy, but in the way that God isn't really leaving room for sharing glory, for sharing attributes. I'm it. So if you know you are you and you show up in a room full of people who are pretending to be you and wearing you masks, uh, you may have an inclination to affirm that, you know, you're the real you and everybody else out there trying to represent you um, is giving a distorted view of you. As a human being, might you have uh, a slight inkling of jealousy? And you'd call it that, and the human version of it is not too pretty, but the divine version of it is saying, you know, this is the reality. Everything else is a knockoff. Everything else is a uh, misrepresentation. It is a, a counterfeit. 
And I want you to know the real me. And if you reject the real me, it's going to cause trouble for more than one generation. And it did. It did. And this is real world in this life kind of, of uh, consequences that he's talking about. And how do we know that? Because he says generation to generation. But look at the opposite. And I'm not going to try to expound every commandment here today or everything about this, but I want you to see something. And I'm going to come back to it, I think. He says, the iniquity of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me. Well, you sounds like there's a limit to how far the consequences can go before they dilute. But look what does not dilute. Goodness. Mercy. Steadfast love to the thousandth generation. Now, if you're trying to if you're trying to be a literalist here, which these words are actually uh, tr trying to make sure you don't do, uh, if you multiply a thousand by twenty, uh, you've got twenty thousand uh, gener. Uh, I mean, uh, twenty thousand years, and we're into that, you know, by about uh, four or five. Uh, he's really saying there's no limit to the power of goodness and the power of righteousness and the power of love to overcome all the evil in the world and to perpetuate God's blessings. And look at us. Many, many generations later, still being blessed by these Ten Commandments. Now, you might say, well, a lot of this stuff in the Ten Commandments predates the giving of the law. And it is universal. Other nations know this stuff is true. That's true. It's not all unique to Israel. Uh, to kill, to murder... Uh, was in the second generation recorded in the Bible. In the story of Cain and Abel, it's condemned. And to honor uh, one day out of seven as a day of rest, it, it shows up in the various er, very earliest accountings uh, of God's creation in Genesis. And a lot of the law already in Hammurabi's code. But there's something unique about the relationship that God is calling Israel to. I am the Lord your God, Adonai. This is my name. This is how I bless you. Now, a lot of uh, what comes up in the holiness code is a unique gift to God. And there are Christians I know who believe that um, that the Sabbath is a particular day, but I think all believers know that when we talk about uh, Sabbath, there is a principle underneath it all that you can't burn the candle at both ends. Look, let's let's just take them in order a little bit. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. You should not acquit anyone who misuses the name. Well, when I grew up, I just thought that meant don't cuss. Don't uh, use uh, certain words and uh, throw in God's name with it. And I would, or even the generic term, God. And I'm still pretty careful about that, but that's not what this commandment is saying. What this commandment is saying uh, don't take the name of God and invoke it for godless or ungodly 
purposes. Don't take God's name and, and toss it around as something that you're overly familiar with or as a, a handle on an ax that you're using to chop people up uh, as a curse or even falsely as a blessing. Don't take it and use it for magic. It, it's not what it is. God's name is holy. Revere the name of the Lord your God. And in the Jewish tradition, this has become an extremely important uh, and revered uh, law that it, so that you don't misuse the name of the Lord your God, Adonai, the uh, Y-H-W-H, don't even pronounce it. And some of my Jewish friends won't even spell it. And there it is. And I think this is one that we violate most when we call upon God's name to bless causes that may just be our own personal preferences. Or when we flippantly say, God told me, and I know it's true, not just for me, but also for you, and you must do this because God told me. We have to be careful about that. Tread lightly on how we flip around the name of the Lord God. And then remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Well, even medical science teaches us that, again, you can't burn the candle at both ends. There is a pause that refreshes. I mean, Coca-Cola knew that, right? Like the pause that refreshes was one of its... Mission statements. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Uh, don't work. Don't let your slaves work. Don't let your livestock work, your daughters, your sons, because it's based on a creation principle. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that's in it on the seventh day. Uh, rested. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and consecrated it. Well, in every tradition, there may be a calendar. What's the seventh day? What's the first day? Um, Jesus talked a lot about the Sabbath. He said, I come to fulfill the Sabbath, but days are important. And Rest is important. And I will let better theologians than I am argue about the Sabbath theology. But to totally disregard pacing, to totally disregard uh, the rhythms of rest and work is to violate our bodies, to violate our communities, and to violate God. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long on the, uh, in the land that the Lord is giving you. Honor them. Uh, well, what does that mean? And can it be perverted? Uh, sure. Uh, is, can it be nuanced? Yeah. All of these laws are nuanced. And uh, you see... I had three words, covenant, community, and commandment, and I'm not taking them in order. But God gives this covenant to Israel in order that there might someday be a covenant for all the world uh, in Christ who fulfills the law. There's always a covenant for someone. Every, all God's people are invited into some sort of covenant throughout history. God invites relationships, and there are accounts of God at work among the nations, even in the uh, pre-Christian scriptures uh, throughout the history of Israel. God works through people. God works among people. God reveals himself to people. God invites people to worship him. 
doesn't invite everyone into the Torah at this point. And yet Christ comes, I've come to fulfill the law. And in doing so, uh, he opens the door to the gospel being preached. Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and into the ends of the earth. A good news of the kingdom of God that has come through his covenant with Israel. But all of this is worked out in community. You see, the exposition of these commandments uh, takes the rest of the Old Testament uh, books, and specifically um, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers to expound. And then the Jewish community takes it and, and, and the, the preaching is added on and you have the Talmud and you have, you know, the teachings of the rabbis because we're always having to work out things like how do we honor our father and mother? How are, does that affect the days that we're living on the earth? And how, what are the implications of it? What are the limits? Do you come, do you, Violate the next commandment, you shall not murder because your father told you to do so. And so we're never divorced from our responsibility to think and to pray and to uh, to weigh and to work it out. But you would say, well, this is dumb, stupid. I mean, this is so simple. Everybody knows you shall not murder. Everybody knows that you should be faithful in marriage, not commit adultery. Everybody knows that it is an offense to steal. At least anybody who's ever been stolen from knows that. What about you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor? Well, I mean, you don't, the literal thing is you don't stand up in some sort of human court or, or, or tribal court or uh, community uh, adjudication process and say, my neighbor stole my cow when you know it's not true. You don't say something that is going to adversely affect your neighbor as a testimony and as a witness against them. And Jesus later, you know, when he's talking about uh, how we uh, over-literalize the law in order to let us off the hook, he says, why don't you just let your yeses be yes and your noes be no? Why don't you just tell the truth? See? Don't commit adultery. He, Jesus says, don't think about it. Don't, don't, don't plot and plan and say, well, I'm not going to follow through with it, but I'm just going to, uh, you know, create a scenario in my mind where I, I might be able to. He said, if you don't want to murder, don't get angry enough to murder. Don't let your, don't feed your anger against another person. Don't hold resentments. Don't harbor those things. You see, Jesus comes along and, and says what the prophets have said, but he makes it very succinct. Uh, these sins, these violations begin in the heart, and they're passed on to generations. God has set it in motion. He doesn't have to decree in every instance uh, the consequences of violation. He's set it all in motion. He's created a universe that enforces these laws. And a spiritual universe and a physical universe. And then, you know, if you really want to make sure that you're not going to uh, overdo it, don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's uh, servants. Don't covet your neighbor's ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Don't feed your want of something that belongs to your neighbor and doesn't belong to you. And then, you know, we, we come along and we, we, we're building on it. I mean, the whole, the whole history since then has been, is this me wanting something that I don't really need 
because I'm even taught to pray, and we prayed this morning, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Not give me everything in the world and make me king of the world. No, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. You see, this is simple, and yet it's deep. And we spend our whole life, in not just the five books of the Torah that lead up to and, and give us a core and uh, explain it and, 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 and then apply it. And then Jesus comes and fulfills it. And then we continue to experience it. One day Jesus was asked, well, what's the greatest of all the laws? What's the most important? You know, if, if we were only going to be keeping one law, and Jesus, you know, he never lets anybody set his agenda, so he gave it in two parts. He said, it's very simple. You're, the, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And the second follows right from it. Uh, you'll love your neighbor as yourself. And if you love your neighbor, you're not going to bear false witness against your neighbor. You're not going to covet what is your neighbor. You're not going to steal from your neighbor. You're not going to commit adultery against your neighbor. You're not going to murder your neighbor. You're not going to uh, neglect your father and your mother, who are also your neighbors. And you're not going to have an environment where people are working seven days a week, 20 hours a day, and destroying their community. And if you revere God, if you love God, you're going to love your neighbor. And if you need help loving your neighbor, you go back to the first love and you love God. This is um, the Ten Commandments for Dummies. I always have to buy those for dummy books, you know, don't you? in order to understand something. They're not really for dummies. They're for smart people who need it simplified. Well, here is um, basic living for dummies. And I'm one of them. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. And may the Lord give you peace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.